Andrew Catchpole, editor of Harper's Wine and Spirits, and welcome to our virtual sit supercharging the entry level offer webinar. For obvious reasons, we couldn't um, offer the tasting part of our specialist importers trade tasting events uh, today, but we can at least still bring you a virtual taste of the features we normally run at these events. I hope some of you um, enjoyed listening to Jancis' opening session um, a little earlier, keeping it independent, and we're going to continue very much in uh, an independent theme this morning. To do so, I'm joined by a panel of superb independent merchants, all quite different businesses, but all rightfully proud, I'd say, of their indie ethos, which, as Jans has said earlier, collectively forms the backbone of quality wine retail in the UK. Um, so welcome to um, Tom, Tom Jones from the Wally Wine Shop. Hi, thanks for inviting me, Andrew. Thank you. Um, Hannah Wilkins from Vineyards of Sherborne. Morning, everybody. Archie McDermott from Lumians. Hello. Jason Miller from Theatre of Wine. Hi, Jason. Hello. And Matt, Matt Tipping of Jeroboam's. Good morning. Morning, morning all. Now, supercharging the entry level offer. Most independent merchants understand to be shy away from the rather drab term entry level, preferring to focus attention on quality and individuality across all levels of their range. And now, while I realize it's been tough for a lot of businesses out there, um, the pandemic has skewed consumer buying patterns, and many indies have actually reported, uh, certainly to us, new custom being driven to the sector, some from supermarkets, along with businesses picked up um, from those obviously unable to visit hospitality venues, much of that business being via online sales or click and collect. And also there's a growing sensibility out there uh, among customers to shop local. Um, so we're gonna be asking today if there are opportunities to retain some of this business as and when restrictions ease. And as part of that, we're going to explore how best to tailor the lower priced offer, entry level if you like, to retain the indie ethos, but also to help beat multiple and online giants at their own game and ask whether this can be tailored so as to further engage and retain a broader customer base sort of on down the line. And um, quick word for the audience out there, please do um, ask questions and um, use the Q&A function and we'll, um, any questions you have for the panel and we'll endeavor to answer um, all for you uh, during the course of the session or, or at the end. Um, so I suppose let's, let's dig in. Uh, first question, what must a good entry level product offer? Um, how can you, what's, how do you, how, how do you keep this within sort of ethos of um, the independent ethos of individuality and quality? And what wines and indeed spirits best fit this criteria? Uh, who would like to kick off? Um, Matt, should we, should we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think for, for us, um, the, the real the real key thing is the you know the typicity of what you're offering and making sure it is genuinely the best you can source you know of, of that style and of that type um we've avoided as i'm sure everyone in this panel has done avoided brands in terms of brand names and branded companies that we know are in supermarkets but that doesn't mean you have to avoid the brands which are the great varieties or the regions that those wines are coming from um and certainly and being able to offer, you know, a Malbec, um, you know, that's, that's well priced um, and allows somebody to access your range for the first time, um, you know, is, is a really sensible thing to do, I think. Um, in terms of um, if you're really looking at the very entry point of, of wines and uh, where they are from, you know, you are going to have to make some compromises there, but that doesn't mean you have to um, lose sight of value. Um, and that's really what we're aiming for is at any price point that we're offering, we're looking to offer customers value through quality, through story, um, through simply sourcing the, you know, the best we can at that level. Yeah, would anyone else like to add to that? Um, Archie is your... Uh, yeah, uh, I think the, the key thing for us about entry level wines is that really the manner in which that we select them is exactly the same way that we select every other wine and spirit on our shelf. You know, we're looking for a product that somebody uh, kind of within the buying team or on the shop floor really falls in love with. And you kind of, you know, you can fall in love with it with qualifiers. You can fall in love with it and say, I think this is a brilliant wine on a shelf at eight pounds. You know, if someone offered to me at 12, I wouldn't think it was amazing, but you know, at eight pounds, this is a brilliant wine. And I think that's really what for us, where the story always starts. The big change really, I suppose, for us when it comes to 
you know, our entry level offering is that we have to try an awful lot more crap to find the stuff that we fall in love with than we do to you know, kind of at higher points on the level. You know, kind of we go to a tasting and you know, a portfolio tasting and we'll find loads of 15, 20 pound on the shelf wines that we really enjoy. There the question is very different. There the question is, is this better than something I have already? Is this going to displace something else? Uh, at the entry level, we go out and try a huge amount of dross so that our customers don't have to, bluntly. Um, we've got a, a really lovely uh, kind of paddock rosé that did incredibly well for us through lockdown. It was a number one selling you know, kind of rosé. It was £8 a bottle. Uh, we were really, really impressed with it. Really you know, kind of went through more than a pallet of it last summer. And you know, kind of, but you know, as we would tell customers, they'd be like, is it really quite good for eight pounds? And we're like, you have no idea how many terrible roses we tried to find this one good one. So when we assure you that it's good, we're coming from a you know a place of really personal, you know, kind of like, yeah, we put a lot of wine down the sink to get to one that we wanted to pour in our glass, I think is the, the way to think about it. Yeah, and I think you, you mentioned eight pounds. Um, quick question in from Janet um, McLaughlin, um, who's asking, what are you looking at your entry level price to be? Um, would that be would that be fairly consistent? I mean, I think if we look at the supermarkets, we're looking at what sort of just over six quid in the main. If you look at, I think, sort of maybe the waitresses and M&S's, um, then you're looking perhaps more closer to um, eight pounds, I think. Um, so, um, I mean, Hannah, you're nodding. What, what's, what's, what, what happens around your entry sort of pricing? So and where it's our at? entry level kind of around seven fifty with discount off you down to six seventy five um, a bottle. So um, that's kind of where we sit. Um, going back to what Archie said, totally agree. We we've sampled loads um, of dross. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, the one thing that we enjoy doing here is we, whenever we are sent samples, we don't ask for the recommended retail price. We don't ask for the cost price. We sample everything blind. So we are in theory being customers, which is exact, exactly what our customers will be giving us feedback to. Um, and we say whether we think it's value for money or not. Um, and if it doesn't make the cut, it doesn't go on the shelf. And it's that simple. So. Um, no matter whatever price point you're looking at you know so so a bit of a it's a bit of a challenge in a way isn't it um because i can see why an independent merchant wouldn't want to be the, the, is it challenging kind of trying to you don't want to go out in there and say we've got you know affordable wines as well um when obviously you've got this fantastic range spread across price points going in some cases sort of you know, sky high um so is it all about communicating the value that's inherent, which I think you you were talking about, Matt, across the whole range? I mean, how how do you how do you actually communicate that sort of entry point, especially in terms of say pulling in perhaps less wine orientated, less wine savvy consumers who nonetheless would benefit from supporting our local independent merchants? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I think um, in terms of that latter point, if you're looking at what the supermarkets are doing and then where we start and, and and that value offering. I mean, we have wines on offer every month. Um, and again, um, I was looking through some numbers and I saw that about 80% of supermarket wine is sold on offer. Uh, whereas for us, to give you an example, wines are on offer every month in our shops, um, but our shops vary between 5% and 12% of wines are sold on offer. So when you're looking at ranging and looking at what you're doing, having a value proposition that says we are offering value and we're gonna give you a, a discount for these wines this month that have a theme around them, our customers like that and they pick up on that and they will buy those bottles, but equally they're not only focused on that. And I think when you're looking at the supermarket customer that we are trying to attract, ultimately those numbers you gave around the average supermarket and then pays like Waitrose and M&S, you know, we're looking for their top customers. The crossover between the lower end of what we do and the top end of customers that the supermarkets get, it, 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 that is the crossover. And we're looking for customers really that are Two, one of two things or even both of these ideally one of which they're looking to support local and we've definitely seen that that entry point for the local shopping is there because people have more time is one thing definitely um, and the second part is that people are interested in where their wine comes from or where their food comes from where any of their products come from and why they are like they are so that for, for example in a supermarket I would say is an organic customer or somebody that's just thinking a bit about their buying and that's what works for us but we don't know who those customers are when they walk through our door. So we have to have a proposition that allows them to buy their first bottle and for our staff to talk to them that first time. And then ultimately they and we will work out whether it's going to be the right mix moving forwards. But um, that, I think that's how you've got to look at it. 
Yeah. Um, Tom, what's your what's your experience of that level? Yeah, it is interesting touching on what Matt said there, that although we're using and discussing entry level, um, looking over some of the numbers, especially that national sort of average price, which I think is hovering just under six quid, so sort of 5.90 something I saw, you've got to think that's that's a national bottle average. And we've just been around the table and, and barely any of us sell wine retail at that price point. So, and what was what was even more shocking is if that's the average, that means at least half of it sold under that price point. So, and when we consider the, the, the level of wines we're selling at 15, 20, 30, 40, considerably below that price point. So what we're actually talking about is we have a, a sort of national entry level, which perhaps we're not, in that mix at all and then we have an indie entry level point and i think that's key difference are we trying to get down to that national point we're certainly not i don't think many other indie merchants are so what we're looking at is this sort of independently set indie entry point and that's where we can start to play and then it's a case of as archie touched on what is the very best wine we can find at that seven pound price point or that seven pound 50 price point and how does it go up against what's on those supermarket shelves and as a few touched on that's what we're trying to do put the very best example forward and say we're happy that if you bought this from from us at seven pounds that it's going to beat the five bottles you can buy in the supermarket for the same price um and that's sort of the key for us to unlocking that entry level is a genuine ability to say try one of ours try one of theirs um, and we think you'll like us more Okay, well, I think um, that then it's interesting to bring in a point, um, I think Matt, you might have mentioned earlier about um, talking about ranging, but also you mentioned um, before we came live, the, the sort of 80-20 rule, um, you know, obviously 80% of your, your, your sales come from 20% of, of what you're offering. And that does seem to hold true across a lot of sectors of, of life, actually. Um, how much emphasis then do you or should you be putting on that entry level segment. Um, and can we also bring in that concept of, of the brands uh, in terms of, you know, those key things that, that are the go-tos like Malbec's, New Zealand Savvy Blancs, um, Rioja, et cetera. There, there are certain things, you know, Pinot Grigio, which sometimes brings a moan around any panel, but, but customers do seek out those things out there in the wider world um, on massive scale. Um, so what, what about the sort of ranging side of it around that? How do, you, how do you actually tailor it to make it as accessible as possible without sort of diluting the overall esoteric, independent kind of uh, uh, ethos of your, your shells? Um, I don't know, Jason, can we, can we bring you in? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of what everyone has been saying so far about quality being important, about, you know, the fact that it's difficult, it's more difficult to find good wines at the entry level than it is to find good wines on the top shelf. Yeah, I, I've said it before, I think anyone can go out and buy good wine that costs £30 a bottle, but going out and trying to find good wines that cost £8 or £9 a bottle on the shelf is much more difficult. For me, I think it's about recognising that there are two slightly different markets. So the entry-level supermarket buyer, the person who's buying wine at that national price point and below, is really not our target customer. I don't even want that customer necessarily to be trying to buy wine from me. That's not what we do. We are more focused on people who have perhaps expressed an interest in wine by virtue of coming into an independent shop or looking up an independent shop. They are taking it beyond the idea in their mind of just an alcoholic drink. So at that point, it becomes important to have a point of difference from the supermarket. So it wouldn't serve me at all to have the branded wines that supermarkets have. I need to look different. I need to have a different offering. I need to be able to have a different conversation with that customer in order to be able to find out what they like, um, discover their tastes in wine, develop their tastes in wine, point them towards the right things. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately it's, it's, a priority for me not to have wines that appear in the supermarkets to the point where we don't sell a Pinot Grigio and it's not because we don't have lots of people asking about Pinot Grigio it's because we've deliberately chosen not to sell it so that when people say I would like to buy a Pinot Grigio we say well we don't actually have any Pinot Grigio but how about you try this this or this and that starts a conversation in itself which I think is quite important. Anyone else like to pick up on that? Maybe a slightly differing view. 
I mean, not so much a differing view, but just a kind of a slightly historical perspective. It was before it, uh, we did, we kind of, I was organising for this tasting, I was chatting to uh, Vince Fusaro, who's our managing director, and obviously, you know, Vince, along with his, his brothers, launched Blue Beans in 1981. So they've been, you know, kind of, they've been, you know, kind of in this, you know, kind of for 40 years. Um, and what is really interesting to, to Vince is the fact that the, the way that the independent sector and the multiple, you know, supermarket sector has really split. It used to be very important for him uh, across really multiple categories to have recognizable brands, uh, you kind of, and to have kind of real price competition. And what he's found really interesting is the manner in which the uh, kind of those brands that you needed to have have really fallen away from the independent sector to the point that they almost don't exist anymore. There's now really no longer a single category where having the brands is important. I would say champagne is still just about hanging in there. There are definitely customers who shop with us regularly, but if we didn't have any of the grand marks on the shelf, they would be, you know, kind of, you know, that would be a real problem for them. It's also, I should say, one of the very few categories left where because of the variable margins, let's call them that, that grand marks uh, kind of look for, uh, you can, uh, that independence can actually compete with most supermarket offerings. Uh, but yeah, you kind of, your wine, it's really fallen away. You kind of, spirits, it used to be a big deal for us to be able to match the price on Gordon's or Smirnoff at kind of come Christmas time, because people would feel that they were being cheated if they were. I think people have just now come to accept that you kind of, you're basically, supermarkets are operating in a completely different sphere than, you know, we're both selling alcoholic drinks. But that's really about the only place that we're crossing over. Um, and you know, one of the ways that we try and emphasize that with wine particularly is that our entry level wines are never on offer. They are simply our entry level or we call them affordable wines and they're always on offer. And one of the things we like to point out is when someone comes in and says, oh, that, you know, just using a, a branded example, when they come in and they see that we do the Macon Village from Louis Jadot, they're just like, you know, oh, that's on offer at Tesco, like, you know, for eight quid right now. And you're like, yes, absolutely. And next month it will be back up to 12 pounds and watch a graph as, as it does that through the year. You know, kind of, we're going to sell you for an honest price of nine pounds 50 every single day of the year. And, you know, kind of, uh, that's because that's our ethos. And I think, a big part of the entry level in terms of how you present it is about your ethos to the entry level. Am I selling an honest product that we believe in for an honest price? Or am I just trying to use it to bait people into the store to get them to go and buy a can of beans? You know, kind of it's, uh, yeah, it's a very different you know, kind of mentality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for us, I would say the same thing. We don't really do wine offers. We don't want to play in that particular sphere. So, from the point of view of the entry level, it's really about saying these are wines we believe in at the price. They're not going to go radically up in price. They're not going to go radically down in price. They're always going to be here as reliable, you know, interesting stalwart wines in the range that we think that are, you know, are effectively a really good starting point for discovering what is in the rest of the range. So, for example, if you're going to buy a, you know, Portuguese red for ten pounds, for example, then we think that is also a good introduction to what Portuguese red wine can do, and that might be a springboard to, you know, spending twelve pounds on a Portuguese red because if someone really enjoys it, then you can build on that. Uh, but yeah, I think it's it's important that those wines are um, for us a fixed price and that we're not constantly in a, a sort of as, as Archie says, a game of looking at where the best price on X, Y, or Z wine is at any given point. Can I jump in with a little thing on um, sort of balance between, uh, we've touched on ethos and image, um, and actually the, the sort of business side that, that we're all we're all sat here running wine businesses and, and that business element is important. Um, and sometimes when we have these conversations, I'm going to play a little bit devil's advocate here. I agree with what both Archie and Jason are saying. But as an industry, we can be sometimes quick to say, I don't want that business, or I don't want to be doing this, I don't want to be doing that. Uh, and in the early days when, when I first opened, um, you know, I, I had to get any business and any and all business that I could do to make it a success. So I had a, a message of, I'd sooner have 10% of something than 100% of nothing. So if somebody's willing to give me a little bit of profit for selling a bottle, I was going to take that. And then it, lead, it leads on to this idea of um, a balance and just listening to the guys. And it, it sort of occurred to me, at, at what point, when you are perceived by the customers as expensive, 
when you increase your percentage of wines on the shelf that are above 12, 15, 20, do we inherently lose a section of the market because they look at us as an independent and think, well, I buy my wine from Tesco at six quid and I'm happy. I, I'm not going to go in there. I'm not going to have that initial conversation. But then on the flip side, you also have to look after your independent image because at what point by having cheap wines on the shelf, do you alienate your premium customers? At what point do they think they're not quite the merchant I thought they were there. I'm going to go, you know, I'm looking for luxury. I'm looking to be sold that premium. Do I want to be walking past shelves with 599, 699 bottles? Um, and it just occurred to me, we, we just need to have a successful range on the shelf. It's all about that balance. Can you do both? Can you have the entry level that we're talking about, six or seven, and the premium at 100? And, and if so, that's the balancing act we're, we're trying to master, I suppose, to bring in the, the widest range of customers that we can sell to. Yeah, I mean, it links to um, a, a question here, which are from Sadie Wilkins, um, which I'll condense just a little, but she's suggesting that um, we've got to acknowledge the fact, we have to acknowledge the fact that some customers, it's not just they're seeking to get alcohol, but some feel intimidated by shopping an indie wine merchant. Um, they sort of feel the need to have specialist knowledge and they don't have it. So we, 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 I think we'd all recognize this. And it's part of the balance I think, Tom, you're talking about, isn't it? It's, it's keeping the special, but not necessarily intimidating those who aren't specialists themselves. So that once, once you get them in, it's fine because you can take them by the hand, take them by the palate, and then sort of walk them through. And once you begin to find out what they enjoy, I mean, this is obviously part of your, 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 you know, your, your raison d'etre. Um, but Sadie goes on to say, this, for some, the level they accept in supermarkets is linked to how pressurized they feel in selecting the bottle. Uh, once they get through the indie door, they see the quality they can switch up. But how does the panel work towards removing the stigma of buying for supermarket entry level wine buyers? So it, it sort of relates to what you're saying. But does anyone else want to jump in on that? How do you, how do you just take away that, that uncertainty, that fear, for want of a better word? You know, um, Jan Siskeyn mentioned this morning, um, back to the, the good old bad old days, uh, using Berry Brothers as an example, their wonderful St. James shop, but you'd walk in, you couldn't see a single bottle. And, and there the conversation was about, don't even quite know how to pronounce it. So I can't just sneak a bottle of Chassin Montrachet off the shelf, I can't say it myself, off the shelf, you know, or whatever it may be, a Greek bottle, God, God forbid, you know, try and get your tongue around it if you've never met it before. Um, does anyone want to sort of pick up on, on that? I can I can have a go. Um, we've gained a lot of customers that were buying wines in supermarkets, you know, over the whole lockdown. Um, and you've got to kind of remove the intimidation of buying wines from Indies. Um, we ask people open questions. We ask them what they use. We we build them with their own profile, if you like. Um, and it does help if you have incredible memories to remember as well. Um, if you don't have the uh, you know, technology to back you up sort of thing. You get to know people on a real one-to-one -one, uh, level. Um, we, we, we've, done, we've done different things to engage with um, customers. We've brought in Vine lines. People can have one-to-one uh, -one consultations. We've had uh, Zooms. We've had, um, God, we've done masterclasses. We've done Instagram lives. We've done the whole lot, you know, um, and we've made it more accessible. The other thing I've noticed is more females are now purchasing the wine that years ago, 20 years ago, I remember doing wine tastings and 95% of the people in the room were male. Um, and now it's a 50-50 split if, you know, and it's lovely. Um, I, I think now, I think women are buying more. Yeah, yeah, no, um, but when, when we're doing our big charity events, it, it's nice to see the, the suits and ties have kind of gone and people in, in, in shorts and t-shirts and uh, it, relaxing, enjoying wine and spirits and that's what it's about. And so when you've engaged with people and you've, and you've kind of got their taste profile, then when we, we're all, we all like tasting wine, we all like sampling spirits, but we can kind of sample a wine, whether it's 10 pounds on the shelf or 20 pounds on the shelf or 30 pounds, we can already, already get in our mindset, the customers, that we think would really like that wine, um, whether it's Portuguese, Lebanese, and things like that. And we've switched people that would normally buy New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc onto uh, like a Certicos. Uh, you know, we've 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 tried so many different wines. You know, and people have really really enjoyed them. And people that would normally drink Pionniers have gone to Lebanese Babies and uh, Cote de Rhone's now drinking Georgian Saparavis. It's just been amazing. You know. Um, 
it's a totally different uh, totally different way of thinking now and i think the personal service comes in is, is the focus for us now moving forward um, and Hannah, I think that's re really interesting. Um, and I'd maybe draw that out a little more as well, because, uh, for example, I mean, you know, Zoom technology we're using now, this was all possible before. Uh, obviously, I'm sure we'd all prefer to be sitting in person around a table with you, the audience out there, who we can't even see live in front of us, uh, just pick up all that lovely networking and, and, and socialising that we, we humans love to do. But there must be surely takeaways from this, from... Um, the, the massive ramping up of online sales, um, perhaps events like this, the realization that, that there are other methods to reach out, other channels to reach out to customers. I mean, the very fact that, that the majority of people have experienced a serious uptick in online sales, is, is that in itself not useful, um, both in terms of getting more information back about customers? How do you fold that in as well? Um, what, what, what have we learned? What can we take forward from these sort of the pandemic times when you will have footfall, more greater footfall back in, in store as well. Um, how's, how's all that going to evolve? And is that is that going to help in any way? Or is there anything you can harness to, again, bring in those sort of new, perhaps more reticent customers to win their trust? Matt, you're nodding up there. Yeah, I think so. I, uh, one of the, the things I was thinking about in terms of our range and what we see in our shops and what we see differently through our website is that the website actually um, has a lower average bottle price customers are paying, but because we have a minimum delivery, it actually has a higher order value because it's than 100 to get the free delivery. So we're definitely seeing a different customer base there interacting in a different way. And I, for me, definitely, one of the drawbacks of being an independent merchant and having the range of wines we have is you cannot have a tasting note on every single wine. So immediately you're taking away the clues um, that supermarkets ha often have with their little descriptions, you know, just their two liners. And therefore it's the staff having to be friendly, you know, et cetera, and all of the approachability, but you've still got a barrier there. You've then got to find a way around. Whereas with the website, you have all the space in the world, if you want it, to have all of the information about the wine, about the taste notes, about providing personalized suggestions, about using all the data that way. And we are definitely moving down the route and already have done of, bringing our website into our shops through the use of iPads, etc. Because what it means is, is that um, if we have certain wines um, on a display in our shop, we can actually have the, the iPad securely held there with a page ready loaded with all of the background information and potentially even things like a video of the vineyard, which makes it more accessible. Um, and equally, if you're talking to a customer and they've got a wall of wine, that iPad can show them all the tasting notes without you having to clutter your whole shop with, with far too much information. So I think there's huge potential just through a website, leaving aside all the things like Zoom tastings. Yeah, and um, Jason, did you want a word on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a really good point. It's certainly been an interesting situation to have a pandemic set up where the one thing that we've gotten out of it is a huge uh, new uptake of customers for the independent sector at precisely the time at which we are prevented from doing the things that we would traditionally do as the independent sector to welcome those people in. So you have this strange double-edged sword situation where on one hand, you've got a lot of new customers, but the stuff that you would normally do to engage them, tasting samples at the weekend, you know, having a nice busy store full of people where the loud and confident ones who know you and want your wine recommendations can talk and other people can sneak in through the front door and not be noticed. Uh, all of those sorts of things have disappeared. So it has been, I think, an unusual period to trade. But for us, what I've seen is that, you know, the ability to use an online platform as, in a sense, a shop window, uh, a way of easing someone into the idea of what that company is like or what it might be like to shop with them in a bricks and mortar way can be quite useful because we've certainly had a lot of online orders that have turned into, you know, people coming into the shops further down the line. Um, and I think at that point, then they start to really see the full value proposition, which is that yes, online is there. Yes, you can buy conveniently. And yes, there's a, you know, a possibility of browsing the range, making selections, getting a feel for the company. But it's really once people get in through the door that you have the, the opportunity to do what we've been talking about, which is really um, provide that personal experience, like Hannah was, was saying to really engage with them as people and understand their wine choices and give them a level of, you know, human service that they would never be able to get in a supermarket. Yeah, does anyone else want to pick up on that, Archie? 
Yeah, I just, I mean, two things. Obviously, I think we mentioned Zoom a few times, but I mean, I, I do, for us, it's hard to uh, overstate what a huge tool Zoom has become for us. I mean, we use, we're doing tastings very much like this one, not webinars, but you know, kind of having everyone on screen, uh, but we're doing tastings like that to the public every single week, uh, every Friday, and then private tastings has been a convenient way to bring people together, but we're doing two or, through, two or three of those every single week. And so just through those, we've kind of grown, uh, you kind of our contact list and the people who are interested in our company, we've grown it, you kind of, yeah, several thousand, you kind of people. Um, and for the first time when we, I think obviously we are based in Fife in Scotland, uh, we are, you know, would have been kind of classic and triggered a very regional merchant, you kind of, unless you kind of, you kind of, if you kind of, the wine world of Britain sometimes forgets that outside the M25 exists, you kind of, Scotland is still seen the way the Romans thought of anything north of Adrian's wall um, and you're kind of trying to get you kind of reps or you winemakers outside of Edinburgh and Glasgow could be a challenge all of a sudden we are you kind of able to talk to you kind of uh, wineries and you kind of distilleries and breweries and just say look we can get now give you a UK wide audience you want to come and do a winemaker tasting or meet the brewer or anything like that we can we can have you in homes all over the UK uh, in a way that we were never able to do before and you kind of coming back to the kind of that whole entry level, how you trade people up. I do think obviously the website's been incredibly useful for that. The fact you can sort things by price band. So somebody says, I don't want to look at wines over nine pounds. They can cut out the entire intimidation factor. But what I find interesting is for us, that's actually reflecting something that we did in store already. We're very, basically, we have essentially it's the simplest thing in the world, a stack of wines that divides our shop as half spirits, half wines, it's pretty classic traditional setup um and you can have and literally as you come in through the door there is a stack just before you get to all the other wines that is our affordable wines they're all wines that are under 10 pounds and we and we list them by white red and rosy they, they wrap around the stack in order of kind of heaviness effectively you're going from the lightest and then wrapping around to the darkest so it's literally it's a way of presenting wine to people is that you don't need to be scared by any of the other wines in this store we are effectively presenting these in a way that's very familiar to supermarket shoppers because the independent trade one of the things that almost every bottle you know the vast majority of bottles of wine sold in the uk are sold in supermarkets and they're divided up into white reds and rosés it's the one system of organization i never see in any independent shop you know kind of we're massively resistant to it and so that is an immediate challenge to people so if you can say look here is just a, an understandable relatable way and then it's the job of the people who work there, the people who are passionate about them, to do exactly what Jason was saying earlier. So, do you love this £10 you know, Portuguese red on our stack? Awesome. Let me take you over to our Portuguese section. And there's a whole world there that we can show you if you just want to spend that little bit more. And that's where the interaction kind of comes from. And I think the challenge for us has been to do that and convert these sales that we've got, and they've been tremendous online, which are the entry-level stuff where we are clearly borrowing you know, kind of from the supermarkets. We are taking from the supermarkets and to turn them into long-term sales. What we're trying to do is get that conversation going. Otherwise, you just wind up with people buying the same, you know, case every single time. And that's that's a very losable proposition. It's something that's difficult to hold on to. But if you can get them into your funkier, more interesting stuff, then that's the, that's the key, really. One of, the, one of the things I'd really like to mention is that the entry level, I mean, we've talked about it from the point of view of how you, you poach entry level buyers from one merchant effectively, a supermarket or a multiple to an indie. But I think the entry level also has a really important function in a different context, which is that our average bottle price is probably around 15, 16 pounds a bottle. And for a lot of people who can make <coughs> wine from us, they won't even necessarily know that we have entry level wine. They are coming in for special occasion wines or they're coming in for nice wines or they're coming in because they've been to the butcher and they've got themselves a nice, you know, sirloin steak and they're planning to have a nice weekend, um, you know, of, of, you know, wine and food and maybe it's a birthday, maybe it's a celebration, whatever. And I think the entry level is also very useful there because I believe very strongly in the art of the down sell, which is when someone comes in and they're buying something that's 15 pounds or 20 pounds, to be able to say to them, by the way, if you like this, you'll also like this other wine, which costs nine pounds 50. 
And that, I think, is one of the most powerful things that independent merchants can do psychologically because it immediately puts customers at their ease. Because I think most people are terrified that they're going to be upsold all the time. So if you have a customer who comes in and it's maybe their first experience in an indie store, they've never been in before, they don't really know much about wine, they'll often say things when you say, you ask the sort of standard, how much do you want to spend and so on. So, oh, you know, sort of 25 pounds. And you can tell by the look in their face that they really, really don't want to spend 25 pounds. That's what they think they should be spending because they're in a fancy wine shop. You say, well, okay, for 25 pounds, you can get this. This is, you know, the Chateau Neuf de Pat. But honestly, one of my favorite wines is this Baccarat, which is 18 pounds, and you really can't go wrong with the Cote de Rome for 12. And for me, it's a victory if they go out having you know, bought the Vaccaras and the Cote de Rhone more than it is if they buy the Chateau Neuf de Pat. Not just because the average spend is higher, but because what I've done is in wine that secretly they, they were just a little bit too shy to say, actually, I Excellent. You faded out just a little at the end there, um, Jason, but I think we, we got the, the overall gist, certainly, of, of, of the points you were making. Um, I'm just going to move it on a little bit, and I'm aware of time as well. Um, we've covered some really, really fascinating ground, but I've got sort of three questions, actually, which, which all kind of relate to each other. So I'll try and try and bundle them up a little bit, and then, um, then um, ask for some, uh, some sort of thoughts and replies from you guys. So we've, uh, from the supplier, Ryan Dunn, he's asked what level of volume commitments, if any, do you have when buying wines you'll retail at say eight pounds? Um, and he's making an assumption you need to achieve say 30% GP on those. Um, just to come back to another couple of questions, uh, Hal Wilson, um, asked about um, buying groups, um, both officially and unofficially, can they help to meet the aims by delivering volume savings on more individual wines and spirits? And then uh, there was a question, so from um, Paula Tisch, um, I'd like to know from the panel if they have experience of own label entry level wines, and if so, would they recommend it to others? How do they source and what volume of order was expected? Um, now I think in a way that those all, all relate. So I guess to try and condense it down to one, are the ways in which, or what are the best ways in which on your bigger volume selling wines um, that you can successfully find ways of helping ease pressure on your margins or indeed, you know, building a little bit more margin in? Because I guess if you're going to be selling at a, at a lower price, but a reasonable volume, um, then it's, it's, it's worth investigating those routes now. So uh, if any of that made sense, who would like to pick up on that? <laughs> Archie, you're smiling at least. So. Uh, yeah, um, I was there smiling as much as everyone else's reactions as much as anything else. Um, yeah, I think the volume commitment's always a difficult one. It's very, it's very individual. I mean, I I, I look at the um, the number one selling red wine that we do that coincidentally happens to sell for eight pounds, um, and I look at that, and you kind of we are taking you know kind of roughly we're taking kind of a pallet or two pallets of that every month. Um, and but that's a relationship that's been built up over um, you know it's been built up over ten or twelve years now. We started buying uh, buying from them, so you can have that's that's been an expectation that has been built up. And really, rather than helping us, it's help us build the cost as much as anything else. That's been an eight pound wine for. Uh, Going with our customer that has that that that's really helped sorry we lost you a little bit in the middle of that actually archie um just the last couple of sentences the last sort of points you were making i think i think you may have frozen out just a little bit uh, would anyone else like to pick up on that while archie's um yeah i'll just jump in i mean um you know, we've been asked about eight pounds. Do we have to commit to, you know, wines to retail at eight pounds? Do we have to commit to volume? Um, and actually, I think from our perspective, quite a few UK suppliers have worked hard to deliver wines that we can buy from their normal list at normal prices without having to commit to half pallet of this or a pallet of that or, or take the risk of, of trying to ship ourselves. Um, and actually, 30%, you're looking at sort of cost price for 65 a bottle. Now, I'm not saying that there are huge, huge amounts out there offered by UK suppliers, 
but there are definitely wines. You know, I could pull out four or five supplier lists and quite quickly request 12 to 15 samples of wines at that price point. And then, as the guy said, it's part of our job to go through that, taste what they can offer uh, and pick out the gems that are there. So I think with a little bit of work using normal UK suppliers, you could you could find a good range at, at sub eight pounds without having to commit to any volumes. Obviously, once you do start to commit to the volumes and you can offer those pallet prices, then we're seeing savings on uh, transport. The, you know, the suppliers themselves are often um, seeing savings behind the scenes and, and able to give uh, better pricing. And you know, we all know volume volume drives better pricing. Um, but I don't think it, it's essential that you commit to huge volumes, especially shops that suffer from small storage or, or cash. You know, in the early early phases, cash flow is a worry. Um, it's nice to have those those wines to fall back on. Anyone else like to comment on that? Does anyone else have any um, effectively own label um, wines on their shelves? Yeah, we do. Um, we created our own label range um, about two years ago now. Um, we, we actually made a decision that for us, we didn't think our own label should be the cheapest wines in the shop. Um, we felt that actually what we're trying to do with our own label is go right back to the very beginning of this conversation, which is to offer the very best wine we could um, at the right price. And so therefore our own label range tends to focus at around about um, 11 to 14 pounds. It's in that kind of price range. But certainly when you get into own label, then yes, there are, um, you do have to make minimum orders for that labeling run to take place. Um, Matt, and it, I, I have to question? say it varies widely. I was just gonna say, do you mind if I ask a question? Which, mm. which wines did you decide you wanted to feature in that own label range? Which regions or, or, or styles did you select as a company? We, um, we started we started with a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Again, I, I talked about earlier about how you need to give customers um, uh, a way to access you and, and a New Zealand Sauvignon was an obvious choice. Uh, we had a Rioja in there and we had a white Burgundy um, and, a, and a red Bordeaux. So, I mean, the, the combination there really was just to give some really basic starting points. We're actually going to expand it further this year and have some, some wines that go a little bit away from that real core, but we felt it was right to start again with brands that people would recognize that our name could be put on um, and again as I say across the range there I think probably you are um, having to order at least um, a couple of pallets to be bottled at the same time to, to be able to, um, to to have a labeling run done and some places were extraordinary volumes but um, you can definitely do it you just have to work through your producers and of course sourcing an own label from producers you already work with where there's already a volume commitment and a relationship is absolutely the way forward because they're more likely to be flexible uh, because there's a, a wider business to be done yeah and on such wines are uh, your 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 own label um is it is it a mix i mean are, are margins specifically any better or is it performing a different function in store it's it's a it's a sort of almost a reassurance your mark as the jeroboam's brand saying hello this is what this is kind of what we're about. This is a good entry point, uh, as in entering into the range point, not not obviously lowest price as you pointed out. Is is it? Yeah, absolutely right. It it, it wasn't to make more margin. Um, I mean, I, we'd have to be doing much bigger volumes to actually make that a, a better margin. Yeah, you'd be having to look at containers really. We're not at that level, um, but ultimately, yes. Yeah, so we, I guess, the guiding principle in my mind was what are our customers asking for us when they're having a party. You know, when they're having a group of friends around, when they have that little occasion or that barbecue in the garden, what are those wines? And we want to be able to give you that those wines to those people to go and share with their friends that really represent those and they can trust in. And, and that was our guiding principles. Yeah. Yeah. And just if you don't mind if I come in, sorry, having ducked out earlier there. Sorry about that. Uh, they, um, we don't, although we have looked at um, own label wines, uh, but we certainly have done uh, our own label bottlings of whiskey, of Armagnac, of gin, of beer. Um, and I think there, to battle, back up what Matt was saying, we're not making more margin on those. Uh, but what you're able to do is really twofold. One, you're able to kind of really reward your staff a little. Um, and you kind of, what I know that one of the most fun things that we do every year is when we go to a kind of a local brewery and brew our own beer. And the whole staff goes down and it's a decision that they make together and they kind of like, they look at hops and you know, kind of, uh, and malt styles and they, they build a beer together. We usually actually do it as a competition. So the, one of our shops goes, does their own beer. The other shop goes, does their own beer. And then both the beers are available for sale in both shops and it becomes a bit of a competition over who sells their beer out first. It's all about bragging rights. 
but also I think the uh, you can have, and in terms of the gin and the whiskey, the whiskey is a single cask. It's you know, selected by ourselves. Uh, you can have it is about take, kind of taking your brand and literally distilling it. It's about taking your brand and saying, right, this is this is what we care about. This is what we think. These are the people we've partnered with. And then the bit that's never to be forgotten, getting your own brand in somebody's house is the greatest bit of marketing you can ever do. You can have, if you can get your brand on somebody's shelf so that three weeks after they've last visited you, they go and grab that bottle of gin off the shelf or go to pour themselves a dram and they go, oh yeah, Livians, yeah, yeah, we should really, it's been a while, we should really kind of pop back in. And that's the kind of reminder that as an independent, you can't afford to do with television advertising and like that, but you can do with well-chosen kind of own branded product. Yeah, excellent, okay. Can I just grab a, sen a quick sentence about what you said there, Andrew? That's really resonated with me. You you said about Matt's um, own label range that actually it's not an entry point if we if we turn entry point as, as price driven, but actually entering into the range. Um, and I think that's that's pretty much nailed it for me. What we're talking about is, is not necessarily the cheapest we can all get to. We can all go out and source really, really cheap juice. It's that point that each each of us has a different shop mentality. Each of us has a different customer base, and it's what point we want to get those customers to enter into our range. That's the price point we seem to be talking about. An entry level doesn't have to be fixed. My entry level price point will be different to everybody else's around the table. So trying to fix that idea that we all have to aim for this entry level point is what causes that race to the bottom that does nobody's business any good. It's setting our own stall out and saying this is, as as you said, great phrase, an entry into our range and it's it's specific to each shop tom i think that's a really fantastic point and um i think we'll begin to, to sort of wrap up there but i think that we've we've come to a, a really good conclusion strong conclusion um towards the end of the, the discussion we're making that point and building on what you archie and, and and the rest of you have said um would anyone like to add any sort of final words is there anything you sort of burning to get off your chest about um, retaining custom about where the entry point is into your range, etc. Um. Uh, the only thing I was going to say is that we all focus on the commercial advantage that supermarkets have with their volumes. But I, I think we all have a commercial advantage over the supermarkets on our volumes. Um, the supermarkets, um, they benefit from pricing and supplier support because of the volumes they buy, but they cannot buy wines from people that don't make enough wine. And that's where we come in. We have wines we can access that are better. And the supermarkets know they're better at price points, not even a more expensive, but they can't stock them because it can't be a continuity line across their range. And I think that's what we have to focus on is where are those opportunities, both specific producers and regions of the world as well. That's that's really the, the point that we can make. Following on from that, you know, things that we've all learned by doing things like the Instagram live tastings and getting these amazing winemakers. You know, we were in Argentina one night and then we were in uh, Burgundy the following night and then uh, we were in Australia the following that week. Um, you know, the, these guys, the tastings get picked up by the wine writers. So uh, our one with Vina Kobos was um, picked up by The Guardian um, and it was highlighted and we were inundated like Archie was saying, we, you know, posting around the country, we were sending a lot of wine around the country and all of a sudden Vineyards was known about. Um, but it also comes down to the guys and girls that write in the Sunday supplements as well. They've got to start supporting the indie trade as well, um, you know, and, and highlighting, you know, because we can all, like everybody said, we can all race to the bottom, but that's not feasible for indies to be hitting a five pound bottle of wine it's not possible so if we love what we do and we love the products we sell and we're really passionate about then we should you know it starts it, it also encompasses those guys as, as, as well they need to support the trade and the winemakers as well so and we can all work together so yeah again pick up a very very nice point and uh, neat, neatly made um with um time running but just a quick comment um a sort of question from Karen Jenkins in the audience. Lots of chat arguments about influencers, she says. Um, are indies not the real influencers now augmented by better online activity due to COVID, which I just thought was quite a nice uh, nice comment to re read out, I suppose, as much as. And I think it's sort of loosely tied with, or ties well with quite a lot of what we've, we've talked about, about how to um, pull in um, customers and um, engage with them and, and, and keep them entertained. And um, I think that's, that's going to be our biggest challenge moving forward. Um, 
Archie, Jason have all touched on, uh, and Hannah as well, on how important the website's become to, to, to get ourselves out there to a wider audience. It, but it's taking the, the skill that's um, set us all up as independent merchants, which is the passion and the ability to, to, to convey that to customers. I mean, I'm still rushing to Archie's shop to buy some of that Portuguese ready he was banging on about before. It's that passion that we've all got. How do you put that online? How do you successfully convey that message, convey that um, the passion and desire to introduce people to better way when all you've got is written text on a, on a website? And that's going to be the challenge for us over the next few years. I think that's a challenge. And I would just add one more thing, which is that I think, you know, in, in thinking about entry levels and so on and the challenge of stocking entry level wines, it is important to remember that we are very different businesses. And uh, our customers don't just shop in one shop. It's entirely possible that they buy from the supermarket and from independent. So that there is a, a balance to be struck there, um, understanding that we share customers. And I think it's also important to make sure that you're clear about what it is that you do well as an independent merchant and not get too wrapped up in trying to copy or you know, somehow imitate what other um, areas of, of you know, the wine trade are doing. I think you know, if the past year has taught us anything. It's really that Indies have a huge amount to offer and that there's a real appetite for uh, buying wine in independent shops and a real you know, route to develop that. And I think it's about having confidence in what we do, confidence in our palettes and our brands and, and being able to take that forward and say, look, we might not be the cheapest. We might not be able to compete with the national bottle price, but we have a lot more that we can offer. And the, the entry level wines are really entry point wines into the ethos of a merchant, uh, not just into the idea of uh, inexpensive wine. Yeah, I get it. Well, well, um, I think at, at that point, I'll, um, I'll um, wrap up the session, but we've covered some, I mean, some really great points to be made. And I think it's been some really fascinating discussion and I hope it's been um, stimulating and of interest um, for you, the audience out there. And thanks for questions flowing in. I know we haven't quite covered all of them. Um, also, if you, uh, we've got more events going on this afternoon. Um, we have a webinar at two o'clock, how to forge the best relationship with suppliers. And then at 3.15, um, we have Building Back Better uh, webinar, which uh, focuses on rebooting the on-trade for 2021. That's actually one we recorded a couple of days ago, but um, there's some really interesting points made there um, with your sort of parallel uh, drinks experts over in the, uh, uh, over in the um, sadly missed at the moment on-trade. Um, but all that remains is for me to say thank you very much to the panel, Matt, Tom, Jason, Hannah and Archie. Um, real pleasure talking to you, hopefully in the flesh uh, next time in the not too distant future. And um, thank you very much to the audience for joining us. So thank you very much all. Mm -hmm.